G'day, in today's video, I wanted to stop and talk about something pretty important in freelance life, and that's money. So it's something I've been thinking about for a while now, and as freelancers, I really don't feel we stop and analyze the financial side of being freelancer, let alone actually talking honestly with other freelancers to gauge a better understanding of what we are actually doing with our money. So I've been working as a freelance photographer and videographer since about 2007 and very rarely have I truly stopped to analyze the money side of being self-employed. Obviously each year my accountant does our tax so I end up with a taxable income figure at the end and I kind of go, oh yep, that was a good year, bad year. But I never really stopped and went, hey, have I put enough money aside for savings? Have I put enough money aside for retirement? And you know, is the operational cost of my business sustainable? It's really easy to get swept up in the romance of working in the creative industry. And as a freelancer, you, know, you feel you can choose your own hours, charge what you're worth, take time off whenever you want, and you, know, you get the chance to chase passion projects. Hang on, I don't think I get to do all of that. Yes, I get to choose my own hours, but realistically, if the phone rings and I'm available, I'll say yes and then I'll work until that job is done. When deciding to take holidays, that seems to be the best time to try and get jobs because clients will call you and say, hey, are you available on this date? And you're like, ah, oh, bugger, sorry, I'm on holidays. I can have like three or four jobs come up in one week and normally they're not all in that kind of spacing and it's just a nightmare because not only do you have the pressure of paying for your holiday, you're then going, ah, oh, I'm leaving all that money behind because we're going on holidays. So there's that added weird little pressure as well. So if you really wanna get work, book a holiday. No, not really. Then we come down to passion projects. Often anything that you wanna do for yourself or a friend that's not a paid job gets pushed way down the list of importance. Obviously, because we're working and gotta pay bills. All I can say for this one is if you have something important to you that you wanna film, just make it priority number one. Put it in your calendar as a job and treat it like a job until it's done. As the wise Maha Sinathambi once said, stop not until the goal is reached. Now, back to the money. One of the lures of working as a freelancer is charging more in one day's work than a lot of people get paid for a week's wage. Now, the client is paying us to be available, have all the gear, be highly skilled, and basically only paying for what they need. If they don't need us, they don't call. So there's no waste on their end. So generally speaking, some daily rates can be above the average Australian full-time weekly wage. But I know for sure what I charge on the invoice is not what I get to take home. So all the information here is obviously very general. Everyone's circumstances are different and everyone's calculations and figures will be different. But just take some of the key information out here and try and apply it to the way you analyze your figures. As an employee, you get paid your wage. Your boss then has to pay you superannuation, which here in Australia is a minimum of 11%, and 11% is low. Most people would be asking for at least 15% or higher these days. And if you have a defense job or a government job, you can be looking at 25% and higher, which is crazy amazing when you think about it. Generally, you'll be required to work 38 to 40 hours a week. You will accrue four weeks of annual leave as a minimum. You'll get sick days and other forms of leave, such as bereavement leave and PD leave and all that kind of stuff. So in general, you'll be supplied with everything that you need to do your job. You might have to buy a uniform or some PPE like boots or glasses or whatever. So as an employee, if you earn a hundred grand, you're looking at about $22,000 worth of income tax. So you could walk away each year with about 77 grand plus or minus, as well as 11 grand at least into your super. There's a whole bunch of things that could change those figures like salary sacrificing and different tax deductions and tax breaks. But generally speaking, that's what we're looking at today. If you earn 150K, for example, you would be taxed about $42,000, leaving you with about 107 grand plus you would get at least 16,000 put into your super. Now back to the freelancer. Let's say you've invoiced $100,000 in the same financial year as the person earning a wage. 
Just a little side note here, if you invoice over $75,000 in one tax year, you are required to register for GST, which means each invoice that you send out, you then add 10% of the total invoice to be paid directly to the government as a tax. So for example, if you invoice $1,000, you will send the client an invoice for $1,100 because 100 of that will be paid straight to the ATO uh, as a part of your BAS, which is every quarter. And this is separate to your income tax. Now for this example, let's assume we've already sent the 10% GST to the ATO throughout the year. So the $100,000 is what we're gonna look at from an income tax point of view. Also, just a side note here, when I refer to invoicing, I'm talking about your time and labor that's on that invoice. If you have hard costs like products or supplies that you're providing the client, or if you're putting subcontractors on your invoice, I'm not referring to that. So looking at some basic expenses that a photographer or videographer might have in a year, you might purchase some new gear, you've definitely got your public liability, income protection, gear insurance, vehicle running costs, vehicle insurance, petrol, all that stuff, marketing, website, software subscriptions, and your accountant and bookkeeper. Plus you could have a thousand more different things. In this example, let's assume you've already got most of the equipment that you need to be out shooting and earning, but obviously the years that you buy lots of expensive gear, that is all tax deductible and reduces your taxable income, but generally you're not buying big ticket items every year. So some average costs in a year, you might look at buying a new lens or a new light. So it could be five to $10,000 of upgrades there. Depending on the total value of your equipment, your gear insurance might be somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000. Obviously the more expensive the gear, uh, the higher that cost will be. Generally you can put your public liability insurance within that cost as well. Income protection is something else that we should all have. And depending on the amount that you're looking to insure for your kind of wage or income protection, you're looking around the thousand to four thousand dollars. Obviously, the more you cover, the higher you pay. Vehicle running costs uh, in general, depending again on how far and how much you travel, whether you're paying off a vehicle or whether you own it outright and how much maintenance that vehicle needs. Uh, could be anywhere between you know, $10,000 to $15,000 a year. And obviously price of fuel is a big part of that. Vehicle insurance uh, for me is about 2,500 per year. Then we've got marketing costs such as your website. So Wix is around 500 bucks a year, Squarespace, all that kind of stuff. Software subscriptions. So Adobe Suite's about $1,000. Uh, I think I pay 250 to 300 bucks for Soundstripe and art list and things like that. All those subscriptions kind of come into it. So the other cost that we should be doing is contributing to our superannuation, which in Australia is our kind of retirement fund that we put aside. This should be at least 11% of our kind of income. Uh, so some freelancers and business owners will put it into a superannuation, a kind of account or others buy and invest in property and other types of investments and keep that as their nest egg uh, and sell it and all that kind of jazz. So there's a couple of different options there to how you treat your superannuation. So in this example, we're looking at that as an $11,000 contribution to your super or contributing to an investment in other ways. So one of the other things that we should be doing as part of our expenses with freelance life is putting aside annual leave. So, you know, most people get in Australia a basic four weeks of annual leave. How much that would look like for you is completely up to your scenario. But if we just took the basic Australian wage and times that by four weeks, then that's maybe some way we could calculate it. Also, we should be kind of factoring in some sick leave and bereavement leave and other things like that. So they're all factors that we should be considering and, and putting a value on. All right, from here, I'm gonna split it into low side of my figures and high side of my figures. And we'll just have a look at the two separate scenarios. So low side total, we're looking at about 39,000 and the high side total, we're looking at about 52,000. So looking at the low side, if we've got our $100,000 minus our 39,000, we end up with just under 61,000 as our taxable income then the income tax on that that the government will keep is $10,000, which leaves us with a take home amount of just over $50,000. Now for our high side, we've got our $100,000, we've minus our $51,000 worth of expenses, which leaves us with 48,000 of taxable income. 
Now the government will take almost $6,000 of that, which leaves us with a take home value of just over $42,000. Now I appreciate some of my expenses are you know, obviously on the high side. So if we did an ultra lean analysis of expenses, so if you, you know, really got your vehicles down, you chose the minimum on all of your insurance policies and you ran with a pretty lean kit, let's just say we go about 25 grand worth of expenses. So let's have a look at that one. So we've got our 100 grand minus our $25,000 of expenses, which leaves us with a taxable income of 75,000. So the government's gonna keep almost $15,000 of that. And that gives us a take home value of about $60,000. Rightio, so looking at those expenses side by side, we've got low side, which comes to a take home value about 50. We've got the high side, take home value about 42 and the ultra lean, we're looking at a take home of about 60. Now back to our employed person, if they've got a taxable income of 100 grand, they've got about $23,000 of tax, which means they take home 77 plus about 11 in super. So we're looking at about $88,000 as their total take home. So when we put it side by side and look at the leanest expenses, the employed person is roughly 30 grand ahead in their take home compared to the freelancer. So as I've said a number of times, this is very general and obviously expenses and everything can be completely different in your situation. But just in this scenario, 30 grand is a pretty big difference. So obviously one of the downsides to being employed is that essentially your time is owned. You need to work the roughly 40 hours a week and the flexibility of that job is essentially at the discretion of your boss or manager. Also, unless you're in a scenario where you get to profit share or you're entitled to bonuses, your wage is more or less set and that's what you get paid. So that can be a limiting factor in the amount of money you earn in a year. So the pros, guaranteed income, regular pay, cons, your time is owned and limited chances to make additional money. So for the freelancer, there's two kind of obvious advantages. One is time. So your time is at your own discretion. You can choose to work or not to work to a degree, obviously, and kind of plan your life around that. Also, there's the potential to earn more money. So if a big job comes in or a client is willing to pay you more to do X, Y, and Z, you have that ability to kind of earn more at any particular time versus the employed person. So the pros for freelancing, your time is your own and the potential to earn greater money in a year is there. The cons, when you're not working, you're not getting paid. You have to pay your own super. Some clients might take 30 to 90 days to pay you. Jobs can disappear in a heartbeat and you have to deal with the stress of finding your own work and generating your own income. So for me, the freelance lifestyle really suits our family. I have three young children, so I love getting to spend you know a lot of time with them and not having to go at a set time to work every single day. Obviously throughout the year, there's periods where I travel for work or I'm away on shoots for you know long periods of time, but overall I get a lot more time with my family. Noting that there is a real pressure on finances when some clients are taking forever to pay or you've had a, a gap in a bunch of work has just fallen through. So keep that in mind that, you know, there is a financial stress of being freelance, but if you can work to arrange your life and plan for it, it can definitely be a really great value. Often freelancers talk about how much better off they are than an employed person and they've got more time and freedom and all that kind of thing. And I think unless you've really analyzed your specific freelance situation, I think there's great value in being employed. The regular income, being able to have a routine and being able to structure a life and your future investments around that regular income. And just that job security is so valuable and I think it doesn't get celebrated enough. I love being freelance, but there's also been a lot of challenges over the years and my wife and I have had to work together to ensure that we make our freelance side of our family work the best it can. One of the other factors that's super important with being employed and should be celebrated is that banks look at you more favorably when you go to get a mortgage or a loan and things like that. When you're freelancing, even when you're trying to get a rental, you have to show two years of financials. So this can be a stress because some years when you buy lots of equipment or buy a new vehicle and things like that, you are really reducing your taxable income, which is great, you pay less tax, but on paper, it looks like a really low year. If those years fall into a period where you're looking to get a mortgage or buy an investment property and things like that, 
it can be really challenging to show and prove that you are earning regular money through freelance life. And then the banks just know the insecurity and the realities of that because they've got the data at the back end. So for employees, the banks just look at your pay slips. They see that you're employed as well as if you're looking for a house to rent, the real estate agent only needs a couple of pay slips to kind of decide that you do have regular income. So that's definitely a very big factor in being employed. That's probably not celebrated enough. And that's why I kind of mentioned that if you are employed, you can kind of set yourself up for your investments and your future a bit more easily because of that regular income. It's very much favored in the financial sector. So I've talked to a number of freelance people over the years and a lot of them aren't contributing to super, myself included. Over the years, I've been really slack at actually bothering to put money aside. As I age gracefully, I've uh, started to uh, make that a priority and ensuring that I'm trying to run the business as fluid as possible and as streamlined financially as possible. One of the other things that's super hard with freelance life is cash flow. Sometimes we can be super busy, but clients don't pay for a period of time. Sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's 90 it can be quite a challenge to really keep expenses and you know, your mortgage and your family life running while you're having cash flow issues so that's definitely one of the stresses that is an important part of freelance life if everyone paid us up front and within a day of working then yeah you'd obviously have no cash flow issues but it's a real factor with corporate clients that you know sometimes they pay from 30 days from the end of the month so you might invoice on the second but it doesn't start to be processed until the end of the month. So it can be quite challenging from that regard. Throughout the year, jobs get rescheduled. So you might book a job in for two weeks time. You get a day out from that job, weather hits, they reschedule, but then the rescheduling lands on a day that you already booked again. So then you've kind of have to pass on that job or if they can't reschedule it, then you've kind of lost it. So that's a very real factor of freelance life as well. Jobs can just disappear in a heartbeat for a variety of reasons. So one of the things about being freelancers is often we're super passionate about what we're doing and we love it. So it's important to actually communicate that with our partners, be it a wife, husband, whoever, let them know your dreams, your wants, what you want to achieve within this industry, and why you're doing it. Often we are doing it for our family and wanting to have a great life with them, but sometimes we forget to tell them that that's why we're doing it. It can be super important to have already laid that communication groundwork out there, particularly during tough times when you know cash flow might be an issue or a bunch of jobs got canceled so a month might be hard on money so have those chats about why you're doing it and how as a family or as a couple that you can all contribute to ensure that the freelance lifestyle is best for the family so if you're trying to decide whether you should leave a job to start a freelance career really stop and analyze how much money you would actually need to be earning to match the wage of the job you're leaving, particularly looking at that taxable income after your expenses, considering cash flow issues, like if jobs disappear, how many jobs do you need to be doing a week to pay your rent, pay your mortgage, pay your kids' school fees, all of those things, and really take a hard look at can you afford to be a freelancer? I think it's really important that we do talk about finances as freelancers a lot more and support each other to just point out some of the obvious downfalls of freelance life and not just, you know, all the spruiking about choosing your own hours and work-life balance and all that stuff. It can be hard. Finances can get tough. But if we are open, aware, and informed, we're going to have a much better chance of being successful and much better chance at living a happier life. So what do I want you to do? I want you to stop, take the time to analyze your business, really look at how much money is coming in, how much money you're spending, and most importantly, how much money are you saving or investing for life after this career? Hopefully we all live a long, joyful life with our families, 
So it's important that we stop and take the time to invest in the future and not just focus on the now. Do we really need the next camera, the next lens, laptop, AI editing, subscription, whatever it is, we should really stop and think every single time and make sure that what it does for us today will also benefit us in the future. So I hope this really helps you out there to take the time to know the ins and outs of what's happening in your freelance finances. And I hope it helps you double check what you might earn and what's actually coming in from each job. The figure on the invoice isn't always as real as it seems. So a really basic formula you could follow to try and help get a better understanding of your finances is each invoice that you send out, only view it as 40%. That's basically 30% for your operational costs, expenses, and 30% for tax. Then you've got 40% as your income. I think if we stop and look at every invoice like that, that'll really help us make decisions to grow and become better financially within our business. Rightio, so that was a super long video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got a lot out of it. If you have any other ideas and suggestions as to how you operate with your freelance life, let me know, leave me a comment and uh, otherwise we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.